Will Hamas destroy Israel with rockets or by stoking the flames of Israeli division? We'll look at that and more as we review last week's top stories. Last week, Hebrew and Arabic media took different routes in marking 100 days since the October 7th massacre that claimed the lives of over 1,200 Israelis. Israelis united to show support for the more than 130 hostages that are still held in Gaza. While throughout the country, hospitals and businesses organized solidarity events. In Tel Aviv, for example, 120,000 Israelis gathered in Hostage Square. Meanwhile, families of the hostages expressed their frustration with the government, saying it hasn't done enough to secure the release of their loved ones. At the same time, Arab media focused on Israel's 100-day military campaign launched in response to the October 7th massacre. Arabic outlets cast the invasion of Gaza as an escalation of Israel's ongoing occupation, while Al Jazeera featured a headline stating 100,000 casualties in 100 days of war, referring to those killed, injured, and missing. Hamas released a series of sickening propaganda videos featuring Israeli hostages. The videos ultimately alleged that two hostages were killed in an Israeli airstrike. An IDF spokesman confirmed the deaths, but denied the hostages were killed in an airstrike, calling the assertion a lie by Hamas. The videos included Noah Argamani, whose kidnapping video was widely seen following the October 7th massacre. Noah's mother, who has been diagnosed with terminal cancer, has been publicly calling for her daughter's release. Israeli authorities called Hamas's videos psychological terror. Ultimately, these videos were meant to exacerbate existing divisions between Israelis over what price should be paid to bring the hostages home alive. Israeli soccer player Sagiv Yecheskel, who plays for a Turkish team, was fired, arrested, and deported from Turkey after showing solidarity with the hostages after scoring a goal. Israeli media headlined Israeli soccer player arrested after dedicating goal to hostages, while Arab language news outlets headlined an Israeli football player was arrested in Turkey of charges of supporting the war in Gaza. And in more Jewish sports news, never thought I'd say that, South Africa's youth cricket team stripped Jewish player David Teeger of his captaincy, citing safety concerns related to the war in Gaza. Previously, Teeger sparked controversy when he dedicated an award from the Jewish community to the state of Israel and every single soldier fighting to ensure our well-being and prosperity in the diaspora. A statement from Cricket South Africa said it had the duty to safeguard the interests and safety of all those involved in the World Cup. So is Cricket South Africa justified or are they giving in to anti-Semitism while hiding behind the veneer of providing security to the fans and players? Two Palestinians from the West Bank went on a terror rampage in Ranana, a suburb north of Tel Aviv. The attack killed an elderly woman and injured 17 others, including at least seven children. Jordanian outlets describe Ranana, founded in 1922, as a settlement, and the murdered woman as a settler. The attack comes as Israelis debate whether to permit West Bank Palestinian day laborers to return to work in Israel. The concern is that doing so could lead to more terror attacks, but on the other hand, Israel's internal security agency is reportedly suggesting that not allowing Palestinians back to work could increase economic distress which in turn could lead to more violence. Families of hostages held by Hamas met this week with Gilad Shalit. Shalit is a former Israeli soldier captured by Hamas in 2006 and held captive for over five years. Shalit reportedly said it was important for him to share his experience with the hostages' family members. Shalit was released in 2011 in exchange for over 1,000 Palestinian security prisoners. Among them was Yahya Sinwar, who allegedly would go on to mastermind the October 7th massacre. The meeting highlights tensions in Israel over whether to release Palestinians held in Israeli prisons in exchange for the remaining 136 hostages in Gaza. Qatari and French mediators reached an agreement between Israel and Hamas. The agreement will allow for medication and humanitarian aid into Gaza in exchange for medications reaching Israeli hostages. Some of the hostages have chronic illnesses and haven't been able to receive their daily medications in over 100 days. Israel has been hesitant to allow medication into Gaza after several instances of Hamas allegedly stealing aid. The International Committee of the Red Cross, which is supposed to distribute medicine, continues to refuse to apply public pressure on Hamas to grant access to the hostages. The organization's president said, the more public pressure we seemingly would do, the more they would shut the door. The medication and aid deliveries come as the situation in Gaza continues to deteriorate. Currently, there's a growing concern that hunger, disease, and dehydration could claim as many if not more Palestinian lives in Gaza than Israel's military campaign. According to Gaza's Hamas-run health ministry, the death toll has passed 24,000, including 10,000 children. Israeli sources say that of those killed in Gaza, over 8,000 are Hamas militants.
Iran's Revolutionary Guard fired missiles at a site close to the U.S. consulate in northern Iraq. Iran claims to have struck an Israeli spy headquarters, while Iraqi reports say that those killed were Iraqi civilians. Iran also carried out retaliatory missile strikes on jihadi groups in Syria and Pakistan. Those attacks came in response to a bombing in January that killed over 90 Iranians. Meanwhile, all of this raises fears of a broader regional war breaking out. But an unnamed Iranian official is reported to have said Iran knows it's on the edge of the abyss, so it's only taking calculated risks and keeping the regional conflict contained. On Thursday, Israelis and supporters around the world marked the first birthday of Kfir Bibas. Kfir was abducted along with his four-year-old brother and his parents on October 7th. Hamas claims Kfir, his brother, and mother were all killed in an Israeli airstrike, but the IDF insists those claims have not been verified and describe them as psychological terror. Israel reported that Gaza's internal tunnel system is significantly longer than previously thought. Israeli intelligence sources reportedly say that Gaza's 140-square-mile territory has between 350 and 450 miles of tunnel. Under the 20 square miles of Khan Yunus alone, there's about 60 miles of tunnels. Hamas has been criticized inside and outside of Gaza for investing millions of dollars in tunnels instead of on civilian infrastructure and bomb shelters. And in a northern Gaza neighborhood that the IDF had already cleared and left, a barrage of 50 rockets were launched towards the southern Israeli city of Netivot. Israeli forces said they found and destroyed the launchers that fired the rockets, but the barrage highlights internal tensions in Israel. Is the government committed to destroying Hamas? Has Israel already begun caving to international pressure to prematurely wind down the war? And is the goal of destroying Hamas even achievable? After months of slow boiling criticism and calls to boycott the final season of Stranger Things, series star Noah Schnapp has finally responded. Controversy first arose for Schnapp in November after he posted a video to Instagram featuring the stickers, Zionism is sexy. But while the original video generated controversy, Schnapp now says his beliefs have been misconstrued. I only want peace and safety and security for all innocent people affected by this conflict. And now, with last week behind us, let's look at the week ahead in Jewish history, which I guess is also looking back. Sunday is the day that German Emperor Maximilian I granted permission to the city of Colmar to expel its Jews. Monday is the day that the Jews of the Warsaw Ghetto first fought back against the Nazis' mass deportation of Jews from the ghetto. The deportation was halted until April, subsequently sparking the Warsaw Ghetto uprising. On the 13th of Shvat in the year 1945, the Russian army liberated Auschwitz. Only 7,000 prisoners remained in the camp as the Nazis had already begun the infamous Death March of Auschwitz. Could we end on a happier note? Let's end on a happier note. Thursday marks Tu Bishvat, also known as the New Year for Trees. The day signifies the onset of the season when the first trees blossom in Israel. Originally tied to tithing laws during the era of the Jewish temple in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, Jews around the world continue to celebrate the festival even after the temple's destruction, rejoicing in the rejuvenation of the natural world in our homeland and dreaming of the rebirth of our nation in that homeland. Looking ahead, will northern Gaza prove uncontrolled, and will the medications deal jumpstart future negotiations? 